You're listening to The Hello Well with Danielle Show, a podcast taking women of color on a journey exploring all things wellness and power related. We're all about showing you how to put on your oxygen mask first and creating lasting self-care habits that will free you to travel the world and live the life you truly desire and not one you have to fake loving. I'm your host, Danielle Washington. Now let's buckle up and start this journey. Hello, hello, well, how are you living? <sighs> I feel like some days we just need to take that moment to just, <sighs> just sigh it out. Um, what I realized Hello, hello, well, and how you live in? <sighs> Sometimes I feel like you just need to sigh it out and just kind of take a moment to breathe. Oftentimes, or I always start my yoga classes with a moment of tuning in. So I was like, why don't I do that with the podcast? Like, why don't I give us a moment? Because we're probably going, 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 doing all these different things as busy women. And let's just take a moment to pause into the moment. So I'm just like, I invite you just to sit here with me for one second and just take a deep breath in. Hold it for a second and then exhale. And let's just tune in to the podcast, tune into this moment. And especially with this topic, this topic, we're talking about the self-judgment where did it come from? Where did the birth, when did we birth this inner critic that we didn't choose to have? And like, it was one of those things where I had to go deep back into my memory to figure out, like, how did I get to this place? How did we get to this place of self-judgment? Because none of us were born this way. We weren't born with this voice that says, ah, Girl, you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not pretty enough. You're not intelligent enough. You can't do anything right. This voice that compares us to others, that's always looking for confirmation that, see, I told you, you weren't smart enough. You're not good enough to try that. You need to stay in your lane because you are not enough. We weren't born that way. There, but there was a point. There was a point in our life that that happened. And what is the inner critic before I even get into kind of, ooh, how did it all start? Is it's considered the stream of self-destructive thoughts that, you know, are anti-self, that scourges us from acting in our best interests. Basically, basically, it is a survival strategy. We birth a strategy to make sure that we can survive, that we weren't rejected, that we fit in in. It's often this part of us that is was frightened, that was wounded, it's, and it's asking for attention. It wants to be seen. It wants to be heard. It wants to be understood. So it needs to survive. And in order to survive, we had to have this judgment that was like, uh-uh, nope, what you're about to do, that risk you're about to do, starting your business, dating that person, Believing something that you're believing that you're good enough is you're going against the survival mode and you're going to potentially get embarrassed or rejected. So we need you. We, we're going to find this way to tell you, nope, you're not good enough. So stay in your lane. The way I like to think of the inner critic, it's like it's this. I don't know. It's like this tire that has this slow leak. That's been leaking all of our lives. And like a tire, if you've ever had a leak in your tire, you punctured a hole, it gets messy. It will start messing with your lives. You know, the car will start driving or the bike will start like riding differently. It will, and you'll start moving improperly. And if it gets bad enough, if the leak is so bad, if the inner critic is so bad and it's leaking so bad in your life and it's leaking and what it's leaking is your is your authentic self. Your authentic self is leaking slowly and slowly and slowly as the inner critic takes over. It'll get to the point to where it's leaking so bad. It gets so bad that we can't move all together. It just stops us in our track. And no one wants that. 
it's not happy. I can tell you from personal experience that having an inner child that is in control of your life and is taking the reins of everything unknowingly because you've given it permission is not a happy point. And it shows up in so many different ways that you don't even realize how it's effing up your life. So in this episode and in the following episodes, this month is the month of August, um, which I'm assuming you know it's the month of August. But if you're listening to this at another time frame, the month of August is the National Wellness Month. And for this month, I wanted to really sit and focus in on the inner critic. Where did it come from? How is it affecting our lives? What can we do to make a difference and change it? How and, and give you guys easy tips to find a ways to silence and calm the inner child. And so this whole month, I'm talking about the inner critic. And I said inner child, that was wrong. I admit, I, this whole month, we're talking about the inner critic. And we're trying to really dive deep in why this self-judgment exists, where did it come from, and how do we move through it in a way that where we can honor and patch that leak that's in our lives so we can, our, our authentic selves can thrive. And so that's what this current first episode is. We're talking about self-judgment, where to come, and we're talking about the birth of the inner critic. And in the next episodes coming up this month, it's everything about the inner critic. So let's jump into this. So we talked about what the inner critic is and kind of what that voice that, that, oh, you're not good enough. But what a lot of people don't realize is the inner critic, because we're going to pull back today the curtain and figure out, like, where did this all begin? And what a lot of people don't realize is that the inner critic started with one conscious, maybe many, but I'm, I'm going to go with a conscious decision that each of us made to shift to fit in. And I, I, I invite you to think back to what, when was that conscious decision? When did we make some, a decision in order to fit in? And in, in order to fit in, we had to let go what made us unique. So we weren't judged by society. We weren't deemed as not good enough or bad. So think about that. Like think about when was that moment in your life? For me, I had to think about it. And it also, the, the whole, the why we made the decision totally varies. And I'll get into that later. But think about when that moment was in your life. And for me, I had to think, and it was somewhere between first and third grade. I don't know the exact decision. And I'm, cause I do think it probably was a couple different decisions, but there's a moment in my life between first and third grade, because before first grade or no, a little bit after once I started first grade. Because when I first started first grade, I was hella secure in me. Oh my God, I was that girl. I was that chick. As fiance says, I was that girl. I was secure. I knew who I was. I knew that I had the right to speak. I had the right to assemble. And you could not beat me as a non-parent because it was against the law. Mind you, I said that to my first grade teacher the first day of school. So I was pretty secure in my, in my authentic self. I was confident in who I was. And between first and third grade, I feel like that girl was beat down physically and mentally to fit in. I started writing with my left hand and I was forced and berated and, ashamed, and shamed into writing my left hand and forced into changing to my right hand. I just remember so many different situations during that time where I just wanted to be me. I just wanted to be my beautiful, authentic self that I thought was pretty cool. And the adults around me, whether it was my parents, teachers, siblings, cousins, aunts, uncles, it all came down to you're, that's not a good person. You need to change. You need to fit in. And so that was my, that was a point in my life when I made the conscious decision to stop being me so that I could fit in. So I invite you to figure out when that moment was for you. But also, okay, so we figured out the kind of 
when when it started like when was the birth of the of the inner critic but why why what where did it come from why when did these thoughts come from and i kind of alluded to it in my own story you know some say it's the part of you that needs self love needs more self love i kind of don't know if i agree with that but we're going to we're going to throw it out there so it's a part of you that needs self love that's that's one theory what many others also think is that it came from, it was birthed from the way you were spoken to, the way you were dealt as a child. It's basically a mirror of your childhood. We have internalized these messages from our parents for the better or the worse to create the survival strategy. Again, it's the strategy to help us fit in and, you know, be right. And it, it could have come also from your peers. It could have come from your siblings or other influential adults. Like I was talking about from the teachers I had. All I know is I don't remember much about first grade, but my first grade teacher was horrible. And I do remember her just not being a good person and it not being a good experience. And I do feel like there was influence in there, but I also feel like I definitely did internalize messages from my parents and this whole thing with, I remember one time in my life where I would, I love wearing dresses and I was in front of the TV on the couch, had my legs open, whatever. My dad's like, you can't sit that way. You know, that's bad because if you sit that way, no man's going to want you. Message I internalize is no man's going to want me. It wasn't about the sitting a certain way. It was about a behavior. But it was about, I internalized, wait, there's no man's going to want me. No man's going to want me. My behavior makes it so no man's going to want me. So when we talk about that, or kind of going back to that is, what's this, what's the survival strategy test or survival strategy? Yeah, the survival strategy test that you created to prove that you were worthy or you could fit in. Was it financial? Was it appearance? Was it your intelligence? Was it like kind of what I was talking about earlier? Was it your behavior? Did you have to behave a certain way? Was it who you were associated with? Was it something you needed to do, achievements? Or was it all the above? Or a mix? For me, I don't think... I don't think it was... I don't... I know for sure. I In my heart, I don't think part of my survival strategy test wasn't financial. Like I don't have to have a certain amount of money to fit in. I think as growing up as a black woman in a predominantly white and sometimes Asian neighborhood where there weren't many people who looked like me, appearance definitely was part of it. And I think my parents played a part in that because I had my hair permed at five. I don't know many of you had your hair permed at five. My mom would have did it a lot earlier if she could have, but my godmother who was a hairdresser was like, she's got to be five years old. And so for my parents, for my parents, appearance was important. So I had to have straight hair. I had to have straight, long hair um, to, you know, and they were, and I I don't feel bad saying this because I think my parents weren't alone. I think I bought into it as well. It's like you had to have straight, long hair to fit in. To be, and it was, it's fitting into this white standard of beauty, and it, it is what it is. Especially growing up in the seventies and eighties, you know, I don't, I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't see someone with a afro that I knew until I got into third grade, and I was like, what's wrong with her hair? I literally remember asking my parents, like, well, why is she wearing her hair like that? It's like, like that doesn't, this doesn't look right. Why would she do that? And I don't remember my parents correcting me on that. And I, I feel bad about that. But again, that was part of my survival, my survival strategy test was appearance, intelligence. I don't, I don't know. Intelligence might have been there or not. But I know definitely for me, the behavior. I had to be a certain way. I had to do a certain thing. Like you know, you are worthy for love and acceptance only when you accomplish something. Is that achievement one? You're worthy of love and acceptance only when you act a certain way. So when I was constantly shamed as a child for being bad for my behaviors or not doing a certain thing, I had to do like, so for me, I think a huge part of my survival strategy is I had to be everything to everyone else because that's how 
I could fit in. I could fit in because that was my role. My role in life was to be everything for everyone else but myself. And that's what made me worthy. By doing, I was worthy. I was able to now fit into society. I was able to say that, okay, I am seen, I am accepted, I am loved because I have proven through my actions that I am worthy. So I invite you to figure out what is your survival stress, your survival, I don't know why I'm having such a hard time with these words. What is your survival strategy test to prove that you are worthy to fit in? It just, I don't know. I just feel, not that I feel, I'm angry. I am angry. I'm angry that there was no one to defend me when I was my authentic self and the slow leak of self-judgment started. I'm angry and sad that I allowed that to happen because it was a choice. It was completely a choice. Um, I love this quote from the author of The Four Agreements, Don Louise. I always get, I think Don Louise, uh, Ruiz, I don't know. I know I've read the book. I sometimes forget who the author's name is. Um, I'm human. But anyway, the book, The Four Agreements, if you've never read the book, it is fire. I 100% recommend reading this book and I recommend reading it more than once. But one point in time in the book, he writes, you know, we need we need a great deal of courage to challenge our, our, our own beliefs, because even if we know we didn't choose all these beliefs, it's also true that at some point we all agree to them. The agreement is so strong that even if we understand that it's not true, we feel the blame, the guilt and the shame that occurs if we go against these rules. And that's where I feel like I am. I think that's what I've struggled with, with fighting the inner critic, fighting the self-judgment, is that I felt shame that at one point, whether I consciously knew it or not, I agreed to these thoughts. I internalized these, these thoughts and these words that people said to me and how I was treated to say, okay, this must be true. I have confirmed through looking around and what happens when I act a certain way, when I be a certain way, you know, when my parents is a certain way, that this must be true. And I think that I've been fighting the shame, the guilt, and the anger behind this. And it has not been a pretty situation, but I do know that there is a light at the end of this tunnel when you are at least aware that this, like, of where the self, the inner critic came from. You're aware of where the self judgment started. And because I feel like once you have that awareness, like, once you have that awareness, you can now reclaim your power. You can reclaim your truth and your identity because those are your birthrights. And so, in this situation, and that's part of the reason why I wanted to do this in pieces, I wanted us to have moments to reflect. So I want you to think back, what was the moment in your life or moments in your life, the time period in your life when you made a conscious decision to birth your inner critic? How old were you? Were you six? Were you seven? Were you 20? Like, were you three? Like, think about how old were you? And can you think about and can you remember how that moment made you feel at the time? Was there anger? Was there sadness? Was there confusion? I know for me, during that time frame when I know that that situation occurred, I was confused because it's like, why are people trying to force me not to be me? And I was angry. I mean, I won't lie. I have broken a couple of doors here and there in my childhood life because I was angry. And I, looking back now, I understand some of that anger. At the moment, I didn't really understand why I was so angry, but I was angry because I was fighting for literally my authentic life that was told that I wasn't good enough to be a person. It wasn't good enough to be who I was. So kind of see if you can remember how you felt in that moment. And I encourage you to journal on that. But also, what do you need to be or to do to be loved, accepted, and valued? What is your survival strategy test? to prove that you are worthy to fit in. 
think about those things and kind of write it down, meditate on it. Meditating with one of those thoughts and asking yourself those questions can help you really pinpoint where it all started and start to begin the process of reclaiming your authentic self. Because let me help you out as well and kind of say what maybe I think I feel like someone needs to hear this. Trying to run from the inner critic and act like it doesn't exist is not it's not working on it. It's not going to solve anything. It's again, if the flat tire is still flat, you acting like the tire isn't flat doesn't mean it's still going to drive properly. So you acting like the slow leak doesn't exist is not going to help you. So I encourage you to not try to ignore it away, not try to be like, it's not there because it's not going to go away. In the next following episodes, I'm going to break down exactly how do we go through this? How do we get through accepting and being aware of the inner child to how does it show up and like and what's going on when the inner child is in control? How do we work with the inner critic? And I keep saying inner child. I mean inner critic. How do we work with the inner critic? to work with it versus against it. Because when you're fighting the inner critic, it's pretty strong. It's been there for a bit. So, you know, I can only say you trying to fight it and ignore it also really isn't going to work. But there's ways that you can work with it versus against it. And there's some beautiful practices that I have been utilizing that I really want to share. So I'm super excited about this whole month. This month is about wellness. And I think When I think of wellness, I do think about a lot of the things that have gotten us to where we are today comes and stems from our childhood. And that self-judgment is a huge part of us not feeling well, us not living hella well. And so I'm hoping through these four weeks, you will continue to join me on this journey of discovering our inner critic, the self-judgment, so we can learn how to thrive. I will see you guys next week as we talk about basically how the inner critic is effing up your life when it's in control. And I think that's going to be a good one to tune into. Also, if you are listening to this podcast this week, make sure you join me for my, um, I'm doing a class or workshop called the Comedic Connection with Noella Star Queen beautiful goddess that she is. She is the most amazing astrologer. She's probably one of the best astrologers I've ever known because she brings it from a perspective where there's a a cultural perspective where she ties it into the ancient Africa, the ancient India, and how into contemporary Caribbean culture and African-American culture, just our culture in general, and brings it down in a way that I just haven't seen and experienced in any other way. And so I'm working with her because this is this week is all about the Lionsgate portal. If you aren't familiar with Lionsgate portal, it's this gateway of energy and this time frame. And it usually happens around August 8th and it's a auspicious time, but it's a time where basically if you were ever thinking about manifesting prosperity and abundance, honey, this is the time. Is this is a window of time where the only way I can describe it is this this massive intensified energy gets this like this super boost, and it's where it's a time when you can fast track your intentions, your manifestations, and so whether you believe in the astrology stuff, whatever, this is the time to really start working on, and that's why I wanted to have this topic about self judgment. How can we move past? Like, so bring in intentions of what it is that you want to release from, like, how do you want to release this inner critic and this self judgment? How do, how can you, what can you say and do, and what intentions can you, you know, provide to yourself that will help fast track your abundance, that abundance that is your birthright? So, If you have not signed up, make sure you sign up. The workshop is on Sunday, August 7th at 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. I'll have the link in the show notes. Other than that, I wish you well. I wish you love and know that you are worthy.
because it is your birth right. And all we are doing this time around is reminding you of, oh, yeah, it is my birthright. I love you and I'll see you next week. Ciao. Thanks for joining us this week on the Hello Well with Danielle show. Make sure to visit our website, hellowellwithdanielle.com, where you can subscribe to our show on iTunes, Spotify, and Amazon Music and never miss an episode. Also, you can follow us on social media at Hello Well with Danielle on Facebook and Instagram and Hello Well Danny on Twitter. And if you like Hello 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 Love the show and got some good nuggets out of it, know that I'm not too proud to ask for you to please leave a rating or review on iTunes so that we can continue to expand our reach and help other women of color. Again, thanks so much for listening and I hope to see you next week. Ciao.